So gentlemen, instructions for you, as in when we take your names, please tell us, what is the biggest transformation you have personally undergone during the COVID world? We have moderator uh, Jay Chavez, SVP and Chief Operating Officer, Ionix EMS Inc. Mr. Jay, what would your answer be? And I'm, wow. uh, my apologies for putting you in spot. I, I see that you're the first. Yeah. <laughs> well, the remaining speakers get time. Uh, but Mr. Jay, you would be leading this revolution, uh, revolution. So what would your answer be? What is the biggest transformation you personally have undergone? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me in this uh, panel discussion. And um, I'm very excited actually to, to share uh, some insights that we have uh, uh, learned uh, through the, our own uh, Industry 4.0 journey. So the biggest transformation for myself, I guess I would say that uh, change management, it's, right, yeah. uh, I, I, it's something that is always integral with any kind of revolution, right? Because revolution is the big change. So the technology will always be there. The technology will always be evolving. Um, the challenge is always how to be able to manage transformation, manage the change, starting with yourself. So that's what I changed. I changed my mindset. I, I embraced the new technology. I had to let go of the old biases, right? And then that for me is, was the biggest uh, transformation. I started embracing the new technology. I started embracing the new ways of working. And that's for me is the biggest transformation. Fantastic answer, uh, Mr. J. Like I said, uh, while the remaining speakers get time to decide on their answer, Mr. J was just thrown the question. Fantastic answer. So uh, for our remaining speakers, you've got Mr. Shashi Mohan Singh, Head IT Singapore and Malaysia, the Coca-Cola. Mr. Shashi, what would your answer be? In a line, what is the biggest uh, personal transformation, professional transformation you have undergone? Okay, great. So while uh, Mr. Shashi takes in some time because it is a tough question, Mr. Shashi would need a little bit of time to decide what he's going to speak. We've got Mr. Hadi Gajine, uh, Head of IT, uh, in tech and innovation, Super Energy Corp. Mr. Hadi, what would your answer be? Um, yes, Mr. Hadi. Hello, thanks be... for having me. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes, we can. Okay. So uh, I'm Hadi Ganjine, uh, Head of IT Integrated Technology and Innovation at Super Energy Corporation. Also, I'm cooperating with Forbes as a tech council. Uh, and first, I would like to give a brief about the company and Super Energy Corporation, then you can have my better perspective in this area. So Super Energy Corporation is an uh, investor and developer in renewable energy industry in Southeast Asia, mostly focused on Vietnam and Thailand in wind, solar, and waste energy. So um, as you see about the industry 4.0, it's applying in many uh, industries. So renewable energy industry is also not far from it, uh, uh, especially during the like uh, recent, recently, like last years uh, uh, and involving the COVID in, uh, and pandemic in uh, human life and the world. So we can see it developing faster and faster. So we also applying the renewable uh, industry 4.0 in industry in uh, renewable energy industry. So mostly in AI, ML, and we have also dealing with a uh, big amount of data, huge data. So in, in scale up our site and the data we are uh, getting from panels or wind turbines or mid mass weather for testing those stuff. Also applying uh, robotic stuff in renewable energy industry. Uh, as a maintenance and operation team, also for monitoring the those data in other part. So uh, these are the things that the uh, industry 4.0 applying in the uh, renewable energy industry. So later on, I can focus more in details in each section. Thank you so much for the brief introduction about your company. 
we just needed one line about what is it that you personally i mean not just pertaining to it sector not just pertaining to your life just in general what would you say is the biggest transformation you have personally undergone it could be just for me i did not know how to cook and i was forced to learn to cook <laughs> okay so for, for, something for, for, in those for, lines for personal transformation <laughs> not like digital transformation so for personal transformation so i used to work in different industries so and renewable energy industry is the new industry for me it's new industry for everyone so i'm coming from middle east and iran so the focus in that area it's oil and gas and like the traditional fuels and energies however now i'm working in vietnam so the, if i can consider this one as a big transformation from middle east to south yeah. asia and from traditional fuels like oil and gas to renewable energy in, in, industry like is a modern energy so it can consider as the biggest transformation it is it sounds like it many congratulations and all the best to you uh, mr hadi fantastic answer uh, moving on to our uh, next speaker our next speaker is mr tuan farm group cio uh, bika max idc do we have mr farm with us all right i would like to believe that mr farm uh is preparing for his answer so we've got mr felix liao director product management apac denodo mr felix what would your answer be what is in just a line what would you say is your personal biggest transformation that you have undergone during the pandemic yeah uh, can you guys can you guys hear me okay yes yes we can mr felix yes. yeah i, I mean um so just a bit of background so i'm the product management uh director for um for denodo if you those who don't who don't know denodo denodo is um a market leading data management data integration company um which i'm a little biased which i i believe underpins you know everything we are talking about in this conference um from the industry 4.0 point of view and we i can elaborate share a little bit more on some of the insights and trends but come back to your question in terms of the biggest transformation i think um uh you know just like everyone else um throughout pandemic one of the most uh, biggest transformation and learning is um uh, as cliche as it sounds is um you know working remotely by myself at home and uh and uh you know when i when i thought that uh you know when you work at home you don't get distracted it turns out when you work at home you actually get distracted quite a, quite 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 regularly by all sorts of different things including delivery drivers um so one of the thing i've learned is it really um uh up my game from a uh, yeah a mindfulness point of view you know i i started um meditation for those of you who don't i highly recommend it um so from that perspective i think um the ability to um really practice mindfulness focus and really cut down distraction is actually more important at a home than in office which was a bit of an insight uh to me so hopefully that uh, there's some interesting insight there for everybody it is it is mr felix so uh... I I don't think you can hear it, but you can constantly hear my parents talk. I never realized how much they talk till the time that I had to spend so much time with them. <laughs> Fantastic answer, gentlemen. Stage is all yours. And while we have uh, our remaining set of leaders join in, we would request uh, the three of you to kindly continue. Thank you so much. So good good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our panel discussion with the topic Industry 4.0 Revolution: Transforming Manufacturing Industry in the Post-COVID World. So we have a very select group of panelists uh, this morning. Uh, we hope the audience will be able to acquire new insights for Industry 4.0. Um, I will be the moderator for this panel discussion. My name is Jay uh, Chavez. I'm from Ionix. and uh, i've been in the electronics manufacturing industry for 26 years and as chief operating officer i'm spearheading the implementation of uh, the ionix smart manufacturing strategy so um i will be introducing our panelists as i ask them questions so i'll just go right ahead starting with uh, mr shashi um shashi mohan singh is a professional with passion purpose and knowledge to optimize enterprise business process of manufacturing organizations to maximize value creation for society across the globe shashi specializes in strategy formulation and implementation and value enhancement in the manufacturing space using it so good morning um mr shashi Okay uh well I can't see him in the panel 
Okay, I'll I'll just uh, go ahead. Now our next panelist, of course, is uh, Hadi. Hadi is uh, here. Hadi is the head of IT uh, Integrated Tech, uh, an innovation and super energy of uh, an innovation at Super Energy Corp. Uh, he handles developing and executing integrated long-term technology strategy, technical UAV inspection, monitoring, and digital transformation. He has been leading and developing more than 50 tech and digital-oriented products on an international scale. Hadi is currently contributing to the Forbes Tech Council as an official member with more than 10 years of deep technical and management experience in developing innovation, digital business, consulting projects, and implementing complex infrastructure. So good morning, Hadi. Um, how are you? Yeah. Good morning again. Thanks for your great introduction. I, I already had a yeah. brief introduction in the last part. So it looked like it's like forecasting this question already. <laughs> okay. So. All right. So um, let's start off with a question for you. Um, being in the energy sector, um, what can you share about Industry 4.0 implementation in, in your particular field? Okay, so it, it, um, I, I think industry 4.0 implementing in different industry in different way. So in some industries, we can see like the uh, IoT in, uh, in is pioneer. In some industries, I, we, we can see the data management and data acquisition is the main part of the focus in industry 4.0 uh, in uh, like in, in different industries is applying differently. I think in uh, re renewable energy industry, the parts that is uh, playing a big role in uh, uh, applying industry 4.0 is focusing on the data and AI and ML part. However, without, uh, of, of course, without data, we cannot apply machine learning on the uh, industry. So these are the main parts that it's going on, but I see in some uh, scales, digital twins is also applying very well in this industry because we have a uh, machine learning there, we have AI day, we have forecasting of the data, analytics of the data and all this system. And there are a bit uh, applying robotic system and autonomous systems in the industry because the scales is so huge and uh, out of uh, control by the normal labor or manpower. So the autonomous systems coming around and the, the need for this uh, energy getting more and more like it's because we have, of course, uh, we had these problems like the climate change before. This is another big deal. But however, people and the government focusing more on this industry and the climate change. So they are trying to apply renewable energy more and more. It's not even like as a, a, a companies or uh, producers, but also in the normal life, like using in the home, uh, normal home consumptions or the uh, vehicles, EV, like the Tesla, that's the reason it's like pop up like that. So it's getting more and more. And the, of course, need for technology it, with this one uh, getting better. So even for integration, if we can uh, consider like the previous kind of energy, like with technology, they are not synced together. You cannot uh, imagine uh, integrating coal or fuel like oil and gas with the technology. But however, if you can look at the renewable energy uh, energy industry and the source of the energy, the, the source is automatically in our mind can be more integrable and uh, um, merging with the uh, technology like solar and solar energy and the technology, they are more better combination or the new part of new tech uh, phase of the energy is, has better combination with the technology. That's why it's developing fast and fast, uh, especially uh, after pandemic. Yeah, oh, well, thank, thank you for that, uh, Hadi. So you mentioned that, uh, yeah, with the increase of renewable energy, so the integration with technology becomes, uh, you know, uh, easier and, and more, uh, I guess, automatic. Our, our next panelist is Felix Liao. Uh, Felix uh, has over 16 years of experience working in the analytics industry across the APAC region. Currently, as the Director of Product Management for APAC at Denodo, he is responsible for product evangelizing and product innovation that serve the needs of customers in the APAC region. A computer engineer from his undergraduate studies, 
He obtained his MBA from Macquarie Graduate School of Management and is also a certified data scientist. Felix is a regular speaker and blogger on the topics of analytics and AI and has deep domain knowledge across data management, data visualization, and machine learning. Good morning, uh, Felix. Good morning, Jay. How are you? Very great. Um, so it's good to have you here in this panel. Um, so we, we have a question for you here. We all know that the key success factor in Industry 4.0 implementation is the efficient and effective management of data. So what can you advise companies who are starting their Industry 4.0 journey about how to handle their data and what pitfalls should they try to avoid? Yeah, good question, Jay. First of all, you know, you, know, you, you said that we all know that uh, data is a key success factor. I'm not sure that is the case, Jay. I think a lot of company, uh, you know, they are very, very excited, interested about things like AR, ML, automation. Um, but I think for those of you who uh, are in the industry and know a little bit more about this area, um, none of that exists without data. So, you know, data is really the foundational piece. Um, so you nailed it, right? So, you know, the, the ability for you to effectively, efficiently manage data is, is um, it drives everything. I was just listening to the previous um, uh, session around um, uh, some of this conversation and there was talk about things like automation, optimization, innovation. Again, none of that is possible uh, without a data. Um, so with that said, so, you know, I've, I've sort of seen the evolution of different companies through different um, stage of the, the life cycle or um, around uh, data management. So I made sort of general observation that I want to share here, maybe perhaps um, it might be uh, helpful to some some of some of you, and particularly, particularly if you're on the starting journey on the industry uh, 1.0. The first one, um, perhaps a very, very obvious one, but sometimes uh, I've seen many companies fall into these, uh, this trap is um, actually focus on the use case <laughs> and not just storing data, manage data for the sake of managing data. Um, you'd be amazed how many company I across, come across and they store uh, hundreds and thousands of gazillions of data. And when I ask them, what is the use case? They can't exactly tell me. Um, so, you know, you know, we've seen a lot of that hype over the last few years where IT gets a tremendous amount of funding just to store a lot of data with their actual use cases. More often than not, you know, you, you, you get, you get into a lot of trouble because of that. So, you know, one of the first recommendations I have is actually think about your uh, business, think about your um, strategy and think about the type of use cases you want to drive. And then in turn realize what kind of data do I really need? So I think that's, a, that's first and foremost, um, before you even talk about technology and everything else, focus on the use case. Um, the, 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 the other one uh, um, I, I want to talk about is um, uh, the relative cloud. Um, you know, I've been in this industry for quite a long time. I think Jerry and a number of you have been in this industry for quite a long time. Um, I think people starting out on this journey has the distinct advantage of having to better go to the cloud first um, before anything else. Um, so that's a really, really uh, key game changer. Um, for example, uh, obviously, um, when you use cloud-based solutions, Generally speaking, there's, you, you can take advantage, pay as you go um, for data warehouse, for data management, for data integration. So you have the ability to move from KPEX to OPEX, which is significant. For those of us who've been building warehouse um, in our previous you know, projects and roles, it is a significant KPEX expenditure. But now, you know, you do have the options to go to the cloud, you know, moving to pay as you can, uh, go model, which is, which is very, very beneficial. The second um, part of the intensive why cloud is a game changer is the ability to scale. So now you can start a really small um, environment or system on, on AWS or Google or Azure, and then you can scale very, very quickly. Whereas in previous iteration of technology, on-prem particular, it is very, very expensive, very costly. It takes a long time to scale. So you know, think about cloud, how cloud can help you to scale um, in the beginning and then uh, tackle bigger problem. Because the ability to scale leads to the third benefit of where I think cloud as it relates to data management analytics is very important, is the ability to experiment and innovate. It is actually very cheap for you to try things. Whereas previously in my job, in, in the customer I deal with, uh, to build a warehouse, to build a data mart, to build some integration ETO, to experiment costs a lot of money. So, you know, I think, I think for those of you starting a particular, you know, think about leaning to cloud, you know, there's the capability that's available for experimentation, innovation, which, which I think is very, very useful. A couple of other things I think is relevant is that extending to the point I mentioned earlier, you know, data um, 
uh, a focus on the use case. Data by itself, when you store them, does not give you any value, right? Data is data. It is the ability for you to surface the data to the right audience by the right tools. That's when surface become realized. So it could be BI tool, could be Tableau, could be ClickView, could be Power BI, could be any sort of data scientist tool. So, you know, think about how you connect the linkage between the data to the end user and the relevant analytics tool. Not as easy as you might think, right? I see a lot of um, organizations who have a uh, tremendous amount of data um, and tremendous amount of business users in a BI tool, but there's a distinct disconnect from going to the data to the BI tool. The, the, B, the, the business user complains about where are my data? How do I use it? I don't know SQL and the data, use, uh, the data management team have no idea what the business user tool. So trying to bring the teams together and really uh, create a connection because sometimes that's where um, the breakdown happens. And the last point I'll, I'll just finish off, Jay, um, real quick, perhaps is something most people might not think about when they're starting on this journey, and that is that is security and governance. And I can assure you, um, if you have the right environment, you, you bring up your cloud environment, you have the right tool, um, people's going to you know, resonate with it, and they're going to use a, a lot of that to get very, very powerful, valuable insights. Uh, and that's, that's excellent. But it's also the tool of the organization to protect the data as relates to data privacy or compliance, which is a significant undertaking. So for those of you who haven't really thought about that or wonder how um, data is being protected in your organization, something worth for you to think about. So that's a really important point. It does not directly relate to insight per se, but you know, the reputation and the license of the company could be in jeopardy if, if you, know, you don't be careful around those type of things. So just some food for thought there, James. Thank, thank you for that, Felix. Yeah, um, I, I, I get your point that there's the pitfall to just collect and collect and collect data without any use case. So I guess uh, the, the audience would really uh, have to think about that and, and take that to heart. Um, we, our company, we started off by just data acquisition, storing all this data because we thought that uh, we'll use it later we ended up just storing the data and then the, hardly using any of it uh, until we, we really focused on strategy and use cases. That, that's great. Um, and your point to connect the data with the end user, I guess that that's really uh, this, a good point. Uh, yeah, I see, I see you uh, nodding your head there. I mean, you, you, maybe you've had, sounds like you've had some struggle getting access to data, but that's probably a different story. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Okay, so I guess I have we have here a question for both of you. Um, so let's let's start maybe with with Hadi. Um, COVID nineteen caught the whole world by surprise, and everyone really just rushed to implement digital technologies. Um, sometimes uh, what happened was what we implemented at the height of COVID was not our, what we were prioritizing pre-COVID, right? So knowing what we know now, which technologies would you suggest to companies focus on when, when implementing Industry 4.0? Okay. Um, first, I would like to say something about the Felix word. Yeah, I think it's for uh, uh, William Deming that he's saying, in God we trust, everyone, everyone else should bring data, right? Like, yeah, everything is data, of course. Uh, for, for COVID, um, in, in my perspective, uh, for, for having some revolution in any, any sections, in any sections, we need uh, um, to have a force or need for that one. So blockchain was there, the, the data analytics was there, uh, machine AI learning was there. It, like, like we can see how blockchain increase or like the uh, the communication system nobody in, increase or IoT. E everyone, uh, e every technology were there before before COVID, but uh, the COVID uh, bring us a need for for these sections. Um, so, in 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 some parts, so of of course for producing the renewable energy, we didn't have any problems. Like of course, like the sun is there, wind is there. But for labor part and the monitor, monitorizing these systems, like the uh, observation or doing some uh, applying some uh, some stuff or in maintenance, we had some problems. So in ma manufacturing part, uh, like uh, based on what what I see in uh, energy industry, so we see the demand for energy get less and less because we we could see in the grid management. The need for energy getting less, of course, in not the uh, 
people part because normal consumers and the end, end point consumers, they are staying home, working remote, even they were using more electricity. They didn't go to office or they didn't do any stuff. So it's spending all the time at the home, the remote working and those stuff. So of course the consumption in that part get more, but however, in, in general, in the grid, we, we see the uh, energy uh, consumption get less. So how it come from? It come from the manufacturer. So manufacturing start, uh, using uh, it stop using the uh, electricity and uh, the reason is obvious they, because they stop working at manufacturing stuff so uh, um, I, I think this uh, give a uh, need to the manufacturing to apply some uh, uh, automation stuff in their system uh, using like uh, some, I, I don't know how manufacturing use it, but so for example, for renewable energy industry, we start uh, using the data for for forecasting and preparing the people in case of need for maintenance. It's it's not happening like we put the people there and we use them like uh, 24 hour that is staying in the shift and to prepare for maintenance. We start using the data for forecasting the problems that we can face the, in the in the weather situations in. Uh, 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 other parts as well. So based on the historical data, real-time data and forecasting data, we start analyzing that uh, in which sessions, which months, which times and during uh, uh, what specific schedule we can use this uh, uh, maintenance part. So I think the, the first uh, the first point, of course, based on Felix uh, also said that, that we, we need a clear understanding about the situation. The manufacturing need to understand what's going on and what's happening. So they need a data to understand this part. And then uh, after that, they start making decisions in which sections they need to uh, boost the technology. So for example, in some part, it will be the using cloud systems. Uh, if they are using the uh, on-premises on stuff or using the uh, like uh, AI machine learning in some parts, even even uh, for training, they they can in, in some parts like especially in the dangerous uh, or the uh, industry has more hazard, they can start using VR or AR for uh, augmented reality, virtual reality for training in stuff uh, using people at the site. It's a uh, 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 for pandemic and of course for uh, avoiding hazard as well. I think uh, it, it can be variable in, in uh, different parts, like in all part of uh, uh, tech industry 4.0 could be applied. Uh, but however, in some industries, some has uh, more priorities. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Hadi. And um, uh, Felix, would you care to, to add to that? Yeah, let me just maybe expand a little bit on, on Hadi's point. So I think, you know, Hadi nailed it, right? Uh, yeah. No surprises are coming from me where I think the data management foundations are very important. But but that that was the case before COVID. I think what COVID has taught a lot of the organizations and my customer is the need for a more um, agile and adaptable foundation. And let me kind of explain to you why. Um, I, I'm based in Sydney, Australia, and I imagine most of you have had a similar experience through COVID where in Australia, for example, we ran out of toilet paper, right? From a supermarket, toilet paper ran out. Um, and that's a problem demand forecasting, right? So supermarket couldn't use the same data and the same model for um, a demand forecasting because consumer behavior changed overnight. In another example is, um, uh, you know, because people was um, people who normally has very stable job was out of a jobs. So, you know, the bank was really struggling to, to calculate the risk profile of those loan portfolios. You know, Pilot, for example, you know, were all of a sudden high risk because they had no cash flow. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that a lot of the a lot of the capability we have today um, in manufacturing otherwise is based on decision using data links. Um, and what COVID has told us, and hopefully told most of you, is you know, not only do we need a data management analytics foundation, they need to be agile adaptable because change is, is the only constant. I think, I think there's a quote around that where you know, COVID has proven to us um, we need to be able to change adapt quickly. You know, in the case of demand forecasting, you know, company needed to change their input parameters, their time frame for forecasting very, very quickly. Likewise for risk reporting, right? Or bank, bank had to use different parameters, different data sources to get a better visibility of the risk profile. I think that will continue to be the case with COVID or without COVID, right? Organization will have to adapt very, very quickly based on data analytics. And that really means um, the need for a more agile and um, adaptable foundation. And I, I don't wanna kind of go into a lot of this detail. I mean, the good news is that 
there are new trends and practice around data management, things like data fabric, data, um, data mesh, which means it's a lot more agile as opposed to some of the traditional approach. So I think that the good news that, you know, from the technology point of view, there are new approaches, new technologies that is trying to solve this problem of trying to become more agile. Great, yeah. Um, yeah, if there's one thing we learned, uh, things can change very quickly, right? And, and we have to be able to adapt and I guess that's that's where Industry 4.0 technologies really come in to be able to adapt quickly to to an ever changing world. Um, what Hadi mentioned earlier about, uh, if if I may just add to that, um, augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, this is something that we experience also for our company. We are a manufacturing company, so we had custom, new customers coming in, and they had to do audits, but. The, you know, the whole world was in lockdown. And how do we do that? We did that through virtual reality audits, uh, VR audits, uh, um, and uh, all dig digital setups, uh, training from for the uh, test setup, test equipment setup, and, and uh, training uh, audits, and all of that was done uh, digitally. So that's something that we did actually anticipate. We had uh, as part of our smart manufacturing roadmap, we had VR, AR down the road, but we accelerated that because of COVID. Um, also, because people were, were at home, working from home, a lot of uh, the support was uh, uh, off-site, uh, and sometimes they couldn't really report the work. We had to fast-track our RPA, our RPA uh program so these things really really uh, uh were accelerated because of covid although they were in our uh, roadmap um so for the next question to, to felix um how soon do you think artificial intelligence and machine learning will be wild, widely used in smart factories do you think companies should invest in AI and ML projects now, or should they wait to see what others will do? What do you think, Felix? Yeah, I think I think from a technology point of view, um, you know, like I like I said mentioned earlier, um, you know, it should be use use case driven, right? And I think that apply absolutely in the manufacturing um, area as well. So that's the first and foremost. Having said that. I think I think from what I've seen from some of the customer I interact with is there's some proven, mature, and high value use cases when it comes to manufacturing. Like for example, um, defect detection in the manufacturing is a very very mature, very well established uh, use cases through either um, uh, um, computer vision technology or indeed um, um, a sound and, and a lidar type of technology. So I think I think it's definitely um, uh, can be deployed. They're very, it's quite mature in a number of areas, um, but there's also a lot of hype out there. So I guess the challenge for all of us is really to, to um, understand what is real and doable um, and what is hype, right? And, and my suggestion in that regards is one, do you do your search, research, do your study, and come to conferences like this one and learn from each other around, you know, what are people actually doing for real uh, as opposed to, um, uh, you know, hearing from the, uh, the, the, the Google as somebody is using robot to do uh, some other stuff. Um, so I, I would say focus on the, the, the established uh, well proven use cases um, and, uh, and then speak to your peer and learn, learn, um, learn what is already available, right? So I think and then this, is, this conference is exactly what that, that you should get those insights from. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you for that. Um, in fact, uh, yeah, for, for manufacturing, you, you hit it uh, right on the head when you uh, mentioned defect detection because that's a uh, primary for, for uh, manufacturing companies. Uh, like as an example for our company, we have uh, automatic, automatic optical inspection equipment that are used to detect defects, but the algorithm is based on uh, thresholds that are set, preset thresholds. So now we're using machine learning, deep learning in order to change those parameters based on what was uh, found defective later on in the test equipment. So we're, we're changing from a pre-specified thresholds for defect detection to something that is based on, on deep learning uh, 
models. So yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, actually a, a point that uh, companies can look into in order to improve uh, defect detection using AI and machine learning. Um, Hadi, um, what can you share with, with the audience about drones, robots, and cobots? Uh, what are your insights about the use of these kinds of uh, technologies uh, in Industry 4.0? Okay, let me um, integrate the previous question with this one, that how we use these to do that. Okay. Uh, um, actually, like, uh, Mm, we we do the the like anomalies or uh, def, uh, defect uh, detections when we know there is a problem and we know what problem can be. However, uh, in uh, some some technologies bring us some uh, mindset and ideas. Oh my God, that was another problem, and I we we never knew that we could defect that one. So, uh, like for example. Uh, uh, in, in solar farms, I will give you a brief example in this one. So we have uh, the big big site and like we have about more than 1 million panels, 1 million solar panels, all same exact like each other. And how we were using the, the do, do the uh, like defect detection in this one, we were using the smart inverters that they are analyzing the data and based on the data, they were saying like the, cons the generation getting less. And so we have a problem in this tree. But however, after using, this is already industry 4.0, this is already something that the system is smart and based on the data and based on the algorithms, get the uh, analytics and give us a uh, like notification that this one going on. However, there are some uh, anomalies or problems that uh, even uh, the, the system couldn't recognize it or if the system recognized in big scale. So that's when the drones come to the renewable energy industry with thermal camera or electro-luminescence camera, like EL cameras. So these are give us a potential to be analyze the, some uh, defect like the hotspot. I, I, I'm not gonna go to the detail, but however, there are some uh, problems. We were using the handheld thermal cameras in big and in small scale to analyze the problem and the thermal problems in that scale. So now we are using the drones for uh, inspecting the big scale area, collecting the data in amount uh, uh, size, like we have like 700 hex data, the, the photography of the uh, uh, solar farm. And then we start in the image processing on those data uh, based on machine learning to re recognize the uh, anomalies. And after that, uh, that's another part that uh, our algorithm and machine learning also start giving us a root cause analysis that this happening and we put a lot of uh, another variable of the data like sessions the weather how was the weather last year this year and based on all this data we also can get a, a um, root cause analysis or the brief data that what can be the even the problem we know the problem we know the reason of the problem and even even we can consider that this problem should be based on those data and machine learning and AI uh, uh, should be should be replaced should be fixed or it's it, it's not a, a cost benefit uh, for us to replace it so this is how we're using the drones uh, in uh, uh, this is also happening on the wind farms at the turbines. Even now, Google, Google, uh, Azure, uh, they, they already have some uh, machine learning system, IBM, for uh, uh, and defecting, uh, detecting the defects on uh, wind turbines because their the size are big and the, you, the safety problem, the time uh, issue, and everything based on that. So they start uh, using the uh, uh, robotic and the image processing on this data. Uh, and of, of course, for maintenance, uh, 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 again, we have some drones and robots that be using those robots for cleaning the panels or like they're repairing, repairing the blades. It's, it's not come to Southeast Asia and it's not common in Southeast Asia uh, for, for repairing, for repairing, uh, uh, using ro robots for uh, operation and maintenance, but however, for inspection and uh, uh, analytics, uh, it's it's common in, in this area. Oh, great. Um, yeah, you mentioned the uh, uh, defect and anomaly detection using uh, machine learning. And then on top of that, 
you have root cause analysis. So you've taken it to the next level, not just a defect detection or anomaly de detection, but the root cause analysis. So yeah, the, those, can, can you elaborate on that? Okay, so uh, I, I think um, two, two years ago, the Doosan Energy, they start working with, uh, uh, with Azure and uh, iTwin of Bentley to start making a digital twin for this, that's how it comes, that in a, in a big scale. They start using IoT Hub, they start using digital twins for simulating the current uh, physical basis uh, turbines and the uh, uh, weather and the metmas data based on that. Then they start, uh, this, is, this is what a real time watchdog performance can be happen at the moment. Then there are, they have, of course, the forecasting, forecasting and historical data, what it should be. So if everything go in that way, with the correct weather, with this one, with this one it should be like, this. so what's, what's, the, what's the problem? What's the difference between these two? So uh, what it's not uh, go in a right way and that should be go based on the forecasting uh, and the historical data in that way. So they, that's one of the root cause that can be in the wind farm for solar farm as well. So we are start on understanding their problems and then based on the historical data we have in the like uh, different sessions, different weathers, so and uh, the different operation maintenance time. So uh then start doing the comparison based on the algorithms we have so what what it can be and what it should be that's how root cause um, it, it's i think the technology and the data or the machine industry 4.0 bringing the industry from assumptions just the assumptions to uh, uh, correct uh, and accurate evaluation of the problems and the decision making based on that okay Great, thank you for that. Okay, so, okay, we're we're almost uh, out of time. So I guess the next question is for both of you, gentlemen. In your starting with Felix, in your opinion, uh, is Southeast Asia ready for Industry 4.0? I, I I would think so. Obviously, you guys are more in the industry, um, but you know, from what I've seen. Uh, from some of the customers I've dealt with, um, I think the, the foundation of the technology are, are more or less there. Obviously, though, is changing. Um, Jay, to your point, it sounds like some of the use cases are maturing. Um, so I think it's absolutely ready. But uh, to my point, um, you know, there's an opportunity for evolution, for example, the use of cloud, um, some of the new technique uh, Hardy talks about. So, you know, simple answer. I think it's ready, but there's tremendous opportunity for new use cases, new innovation, because we touched on some of these things already. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, and, and Hadi? Okay, so the, the, the uh, obvious answer is yes. If, if not, why we have this webinar? So it means there is a need. That's why the people like uh, us or other people come and making this webinar and events to talk and share about it. it, it maybe it's, it's, it's not reached to the point, but it start, it start preparing for it. So the, that's the first thing that the knowledge sharing come in here. The knowledge sharing and the industries that can provide these services, they come to these events or they're preparing uh, themselves to present them uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, in, in the technology, Southeast Asia um, teaching uh, very well. Like uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking it's because of the population uh, focus in this area as well. So of course, Southeast Asia is like the. Uh, uh, you know, this is half of the world. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so the needs getting more, the needs in many industry and the, even the manufacturing, the investment, like the big companies coming here and investing in this area for uh, manpower as well. So yeah, the, the needs there, the, the potential is also there. The supply is also coming and everything going well. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you, both, uh, both of you. I think we're ready but the journey is still a long way to go. Yeah. Um, so we should start. If you haven't started, we should start now, right? Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, the question here is uh, maybe we'll start with, with you, Hadi. How critical is uh, operational excellence before we go to digital transformation? So um, he said that from his experience, operational excellence and digital transformation go in sync. So what do you think, Hadi? 
it's um, it, it's not a like a general answer for this uh, general answer for this question because it depends uh, in which part you are working. But I, I think uh, uh, there is no priority for uh, which one. So you can do this one, then you pay based on based on which which part of the chain that you are. If you are the early chain, maybe this is uh, one one has a priority to another. But uh, I, I think going and think and get along that can be also an option for many industries in in general. That's right. Uh, and you, Felix, so the question is, how critical is operational excellence before we go to digital transformation? I, I, I mean, short answer, we're running out of time. Absolutely critical, right? In my view, I'm a technologist, but technology is just an enabler, right? If you don't have the right process, the right organizational structure, the right operational excellence and ability to just, uh, execute, technology is not going to help you. So I think you need to have the, uh, the operational excellence and then technology really allow you to take to the next level. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have another question here. Um, uh, nowadays, technology should be developed in renewable energy. Um, so how does that tie in with, with the Industry 4.0? Uh, I guess, Hadi, you can answer that. Okay. Look at the Tesla car. <laughs> That's how it's get along together. So everything there, the machine learning AI there, the renewable energy is there, the technology is there, even the uh, traditional like manufacturing is also there. So everything combined there and that's that just like, even uh, the finance is also there. So that, that's a simple example. So if you look at uh, we, what we are using daily, so uh, maybe previously that renewable energy used only for some part, but however, it's involving our lives. And when we are saying involving our lives, industry 4.0 is already in our lives. But uh, uh, maybe it's more than manufacturing part. When we are using these smartphones, that's fully industry 4.0. So because the needs in this in, in section, the, the market in this section is bigger. So industry 4.0 applied faster. So like the, the big uh, uh, social media and the providers like Facebook, they are using machine learning and the data uh, analytics like long, long before the NASCOP, their marketing and the in income sections. So, or okay. the other part of the technologies. But however, the uh, renewable energy involving in uh, daily life and when it's involving in daily life, so the market gets bigger and the, the providers uh, um, putting too much effort and they, of course, um, mind there. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for that. And uh, I guess we're uh, out of time. Um, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for listening to this panel discussion. So I guess the message here from, from the panel is we're ready. Are you ready? I think everybody should go ahead. Um, post COVID, this is everything that uh, we should focus on in order to increase our competitiveness. So thank you very much, everyone. Fantastic, uh, gentlemen. Like we always say, we at Exito, right? Applaud, why we applaud you. We would request you to applaud yourselves along with us a big round of applause gentlemen what a session that was and uh, before i get to the takeaway a couple of messages for you we've got muhammad the azaz who writes in nice sharing we've got sayuj sayuj uh, gives a shout out to the attendees please know that you may drop your questions in the q a tab sayuj you'd be happy to know that all these members are absolutely doing that we've got aldrich chen who writes in good morning to you jay thank you for moderating this panel <laughs> that's a shout out to mr jay uh, we've got Gregory writing, good morning, everyone, on behalf of IOBA uh, team. We are happy to sponsor MITS this year. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Gregory. And we've got Muhammad Mansoor who writes, good morning, everyone. Okay, so I believe uh, it's still morning time where Muhammad stays. Gentlemen, what a session that was, right? Right from uh, a mismanagement of data statistics, hence running all the toilet paper to using AR, VR for audit to industry 4.0. Oh my God, I think you've covered every stretch of topic in this brilliant session. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for your time and uh, absolutely looking forward to seeing and hearing all of you very soon. Thank you so much, gentlemen.